God is. And, and in that blank, God is blank. In that blank, whatever you put in that blank will describe how you're going to live your life for God because what you believe about God affects the way that you live, right? We talked about God is omni, omnipresent, omniscient, all-knowing, and he's omnipotent, all-powerful. So it gives us a chance to know that God is everywhere all the time and he has the power to do anything he wants to do. We talked about God being sovereign. God is sovereign, meaning he has supreme authority and he answers to no one. God is sovereign, and sometimes God's sovereignty may not make sense to us, but the sovereignty of God works out the details even when it doesn't make sense to us. And God is faithful, meaning he's full of trust, and God is truth. We've been in that. As you start thinking about what we've talked about, and if that's what you believe about God, then it affects the way that you live. So when you hit a challenge, you know that God is faithful. Like when we talked about the children, uh, coming out of the children of God, coming out of Egypt, being delivered and coming to the banks of the Red Sea, we see God being faithful. Even when it didn't make sense, we see God being sovereign. We see God being all powerful because he made a way. But then you see some challenges come from the people to where they rebel again on the other side of the Red Sea. When they get to cross dry ground and get to the other side, you see them returning to some stupidity is what I'll call it. They return to some stupidity, and God is still faithful to raise people up, even in a time like that, to make a difference. And I believe it's because God is faithful to us, even when people choose not to be faithful to him. There are always going to be times when you feel like you taking a stand or you being consistent and faithful to the Lord is going to come with a challenge. Can I tell you, if it were easy, everybody would be a follower of Jesus. It may be a challenge, but it's a challenge worth accepting, and it's a challenge worth living. And so God, this week I want to talk to you about God is grace. Now, this is a really challenging topic for me. Because whenever I first became saved, God rescued me from this massive dysfunctional life. Turned me around 180 degrees. So... I used to say it, that God, he he turned my life around 360 degrees, but I learned that that's not good. That means you're right back to where you started, and that's not what the goal is. I was like, man, God changed my life. And look, here's the crazy thing. If you say anything with excitement, sometimes in church, people amen you anyway. God turned my life 360 degrees. They're like, come on. And I'm like, I ain't never been the same. They're like, but the person actually listening would say, Wait a minute. That means you started where you started from. You said, hey, here I go right back the way you, it's 180 degrees. Well, I fixed it. I fixed the way I said it. But what I meant and what I said were two different things. So just to understand, if you, miss, if you don't understand something I'm saying, it's not what I meant. But in my brain, it sounded good. It's what I got my wife for. She always tells me where I messed up. I'd be preaching. I'm like, God wants us to be more holier. She'd be like, "Mm mm-mm. I'm like, oh, you don't think he does? She's like, it's more holy. I don't care if it's grammatically correct. It just sounds more like I've emphasized the holier part when I say more holier. And you know what? All the rednecks in the South said amen when I said it. (laughs) They were like, oh, I like that. That's good. Roll Tide. It was was one of those moments. And so I would... When it, when it comes to, so I, would have, I had this, this radical encounter, this radical encounter with Jesus Christ, and it became about all the things that I didn't do anymore. And anytime someone talked about grace, I thought they were giving a license to sin. When they start talking about grace, I'm like, oh, there's enough people got grace, preacher. You need to talk about, you need to talk about some justice up in here. You need to talk about how God going to slap somebody. You need to talk about they going to burn in hell. God, you going to have to get these people talk about grace. The problem was, is it's only by God's grace that you ever have an opportunity to be righteous before God. And it's God's grace that makes the difference. And I want you to understand me today as we talk about grace, that God is perfect in the balance of his grace and his mercy and his justice. God disciplines those he loves. And that's a part of grace. God's grace disciplines us. 
Look, if you're a parent in this room, you understand it's not your hate for your child. It's your love for your child and your grace that you teach them a lesson. When you discipline them, it's because you love them, not because you despise them. Not because you're, you, you don't like them. You discipline them because you love them. If you didn't love them, you would let them run amok and do whatever. But because you love them, you're going to show, you're going to show them a way to live. It's, it's love. It is a discipline. So God is grace. And what you believe about grace affects the way you receive grace, the way that you live grace out in your life. We, we talked about how grace delivers. That's what we see happening in the children of Israel in Egypt. We know that grace can change your name. It changed Jacob's name from that to Israel. We, if you ever want to see a beautiful story in the picture of grace painted in, in one of the Old Testament books, all you have to do is read the book of Hosea. Hosea is a beautiful, I'm probably going to preach a series out of it before too long. So just to give you kind of a a short nugget of it, God calls Hosea to marry this woman, Gomer, who is a wife of whoredom. And here's what that means is, is not that she wasn't a prostitute. She enjoyed what she was doing just out of a sinful lifestyle. She wasn't doing it to make ends meet. She just enjoyed the, 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 the brokenness and the dysfunction. She just couldn't stay away from it. Had three children, which all has meanings. And God is teaching Hosea a lesson and how his people have done him, this love that he shows. And he says in, in Hosea chapter one, he, he, it's this restoration where he calls to Mary. In Hosea chapter two, it is this, it is this merciful act where she leaves again, this, and then God in Hosea three calls him to pay a price for her to buy back this adulterous wife of his. It said, the the word teaches, it says, the Lord said to me, go again, love the woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery, just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel. You want to talk about just wreck you? When you see so many people that are willfully going against the love and the mercy and the grace of God, can I tell you, God still loves them. It's only the grace that can redeem them, but God's love for them is unchanging. The love that God has for his children, the love that God has for the souls that he's created is unchanging. And God gives an opportunity and he pays, makes Hosea pay a price that no one else was willing to pay. Can I tell you, God paid a price for you that no one else was willing to pay and no one else could afford. That is the most beautiful picture of God's grace. Go read the the whole book. It's a beautiful story of God's redemptive picture uh, for us. But God's grace to us allows us to be in relationship with Jesus, okay? So there is a difference between grace and mercy. See, mercy, Max Licato says, is the decision of God not to punish us. That's mercy. But the grace is the decision of God to save and to bless us. His mercy doesn't punish us. His grace receives us and blesses us. That's his grace. So what is grace? Well, let's look at some some verses today. Grace is eternal. Ephesians 1 verses 4 through 6 says, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. It's eternal. It is free. Romans 3.24 says, And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Grace is the opposite of works. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, we're going to reference this back again. It says, for as by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Romans 11, verse 6, and if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. See, the Bible teaches us that grace is completely unmerited. The gift and the act of giving has nothing at all to do with our merit or innate qualities. In fact, it quite clearly says to us that we don't deserve the salvation of God. 
but God demonstrates his own love. Romans chapter five, verse eight through 10, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. And can I tell you, grace does not stop once you are saved. It is God's grace to us for the rest of our lives working within and upon us. And the Bible encourages us that there are many benefits to grace that secures our lives for every follower of Jesus. See, grace justifies us before a holy God. Grace provides us access to God to communicate and fellowship with him, right? We now have the, the tail is, the, the, I'm sorry, the veil is torn from top to bottom, meaning only, I mean, no man could rip it from the top, only God could from the top to bottom. And now by God's grace, through Jesus Christ, we have divine access to the throne. Prayer through grace is a powerful weapon to be used for greatness, Grace disciplines and trains us to live in a way that honors God. Do you know that you can't even live holy without grace? Anytime that you think you are so just above everyone, you ain't living in grace, you're living in law. Let me tell you something. The law of God is still powerful, but the law of God only has the power to reveal where you've missed it. The grace of God gives us the opportunity to live redeemed under what we've realized. When I realize where I've missed it, the grace of God says, you don't have to anymore. And I get to live free. It's God's mercy on our lives that grants us immeasurable spiritual riches. Grace helps us in our every need. Grace is the reason behind our every deliverance. If you struggle and are addicted to anything, do you want to know what's going to get you over that addiction? Yes, God's power through his grace. When people will pray so many different ways for deliverance, and they, I mean, look, you can shout about it, you can cry about it, you can talk soft about it. If you ask Jesus to deliver you, if you say, Jesus, deliver me from, and you name whatever the issue is, in Jesus' name, by his grace, he will deliver you. He is faithful. When you call on his name and you ask him to save you, you ask him to deliver you, guess what he will do? He will do just that. If not, then we may as well close up and go home. The issue lies in, is grace going to be something that we use as an excuse to keep on doing what we were doing, or are we going to understand grace is the truth that is is that we don't have to live that way anymore? It's God's grace that turns your life around and puts you on the right path, and it's God's grace that keeps you living that way. You ever seen someone that claims to be a believer and they treat people like trash? There are times where people will brag about how long they've been a Christian. And my question will be, well, when's the last time you led anybody to Jesus? Like the biggest embarrassment should be in our lives that if we've worked somewhere for a long time and no one even knows that we believe in God, it ought to be the most paramount thing in our lives. But I just don't want to, I don't, I don't want anybody to think I'm weird. Let me tell you something. You have God's grace. So just understand this. You're weird already. Now, let's just go on and let's make it easy for everybody. You're weird. I'm trying to be cool. You're not. We're not in middle school anymore. We're not in high school trying to sit at a certain table or hang out at certain places. We are grown people that God says, (laughs) Paul said it this way, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. When I became a man, I put childish things away. The grace of God will cause you to live in a mature way that you will bring an answer to a problem. Only God's grace can do that. God's grace preserves us. It comforts us. It encourages us. It strengthens us. Grace is incredible. I would dare say that grace is amazing. That's why John Newton wrote in 1772 when God changed his life Amazing Grace, you know the song. Amazing Grace is a song that even church people know. I mean, even people that don't go to church know. You could go, you could be in the middle of a club and some drunken singer could start singing Amazing Grace and every drunk in the house and black house, sweet to sound. But it's such a powerful 
The lyrics he wrote, so powerful, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. That's grace. It was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Do you want to know what it is when you come to Jesus Christ and he saves you? Do you want to know what that 10,000 pounds lifted off of you is? It's not just his mercy, it's his grace. It's his grace that can take your jacked up life and make it righteous. It can take your frown and turn it to a smile no matter what you face. His grace will preserve you and encourage you and bring you through any moment. Grace is amazing. But at times I felt like grace is scandalous in the way that people misuse it. I always try to teach my kids lessons, you know, I look for, I worked for a pastor in Shreveport, Louisiana. He had told me a story of him disciplining his daughter and he said, I took a chance, I took an opportunity when I was disciplined, she deserved to be disciplined. And I was a teacher about grace. I was like, you know what? I want to be a godly parent, so I'm going to teach my kid about grace. Well, we have three. Our first one, Gavin, he was a really good baby, really good, really good, really good toddler, really I, God's just been good to us with Gavin. I mean, he's, he's got his challenges, don't get me wrong. And I don't have time to name them all, but oh, and all in all, he's, God's been pretty good to us. Now, God's been really good to us with grace, but it didn't start that way. Grace was a terror. When I tell you that grace was bad from the moment that she was born, she was bad. We used, to, we used to would have bet money that she levitated to the living room in the morning as a, as a one-and-a-half-year-old, just like, had the most beautiful eyes and beautiful hair, and it's like, oh, she's about to break everything. She was so strong. She had such a strong will, such a strong will. April, yes, yeah, she read the Word of God. I'm reading the Word of God, but she was reading Dobson's Strong Will Child like it was the Bible, too. She's like, there, there are other moms with kids like this, Johnny. And I'm like, I know, man, it's going to be all right. You grown. Stop letting her break you. You know what I mean? Like, it's a little kid. She'd call me from work. You got to come home. I'm like, why? She's like, I got her closed in her room, and she's being so bad. I was like, she's two. You are grown. You're much bigger than her. You will win. I don't know. I just have a bad thoughts. I can't I didn't even feel this way about my own kid. And I'm like, all right, I'm coming home. <laughs> it's tough times. I come home, and I mean, she literally, her hair would be all, not April's, but Grace's, hair would be all crazy and cattywampus. And I'd open that door, and she'd be like, she'd go from like tear herself up like a little Tasmanian devil to like she'd have these little beautiful blue eyes, and she'd, hey, Daddy. April come in with a flying tomahawk elbow to the back of my head. <laughs> well, one day, I was like, you know what? Grace deserved to be punished. And she was strong, and April couldn't really punish her really well because she was, even though April was bigger, she just couldn't make herself be strong enough to, to discipline her, and, and, and I was willing to meet the, the challenge. And, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to teach Lexi Grace about grace. After all, her name's Alexander Grace. It'd be cool that she learned her name. And so I get ready. I was like, you know what you've done? Yes, sir. You know, you, you know you're going to get a spanking. You deserve a spanking, don't you? <laughs> she just, I mean, she's letting it go. And I got emotional as I started telling her about it. I said, you know what? You deserve a spanking. Let me teach you about God's grace. And I started teaching her about grace, and she's like, oh, I like grace. I can see it in her eyes. She's like, oh, yeah, this is good. Several weeks go by, come home. <laughs> I had one of those wait till your dad gets home moments. I go in her room. She comes up to me. Daddy, can you teach me about grace? <laughs> she knew she was all jacked up in what she was doing. She wanted another lesson on grace. 
And you know what's sad but true? I think we learned that same model. God's incredible, merciful grace to us. And we take it for granted and we try to use it as an excuse instead of a powerful, transformational doctrine in our lives. Ephesians chapter 2, Paul breaks grammatical rules and he starts sentences and doesn't finish it. And he's like, he's, he gets so caught up in grace and, and it's like you were, but God and by grace, he, he says. And, and so he starts it in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. He says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin. Can I tell you that if you're in Christ, you are not what you were. You are made new. God's grace does that. Then verse 3 says, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and followed its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. What is he saying? Look, all of us at some point have been despicable. We've been wicked. We've been vile. We've been pitiful. We've been contemptible. We've, we've been, we have been jacked up. All of us have, right? I mean, you may not come to church to be encouraged that way today, but all of us have missed it. There's no one who is perfect. No, not one. All of us. That's, when I hear people talk about their testimony and that, They'll hear in, in years past when I'd share kind of in full what God set me free and how God changed my life. It was such a radical conversion. Like, I just, I want a story like yours. And I go, if you got a story in Jesus, you got the greatest story. You don't have to, look, testimony is not story topper hour. Oh, you think what you did is bad? <laughs> you smoke crack? I sold crack. Then smoked it with them. And then I slapped them for crack. I mean, like there's any kind of like, man, I was just, we were all lost, right? All of us have been, all of us have been lost. But until we see ourselves as a sinner, we will never see our need for a savior. Until we see that we were lost. And so the most confusing thing to me is when someone says something like, man, I've always been a pretty good person. Can I tell you? Hell's going to be full of good people. It's not by our goodness that gets us there. It's only by his grace. So I had this great lesson that I just learned over time. I started... I would start, I felt very judgmental in the way that I was living. And I was just, man, I've had this route. And man, people, some people just don't get it like I got it. Can I tell you, that's not God's grace. That is pride. That is the enemy trying to derail you from the great gift that God's given you. And I can tell you that the longer that I'm saved, the more grace I realize it takes for me to live the life that God desires. It's almost as if your life represents the pattern of a child, right? We come in childlike faith. I confess you are Lord. I need a Savior. Save me. Be my Lord. Be my King. We confess. We believe in our heart. Jesus, God raised Jesus from the dead. We believe. So Romans teaches us that. And we start in this. It's just, just love and we nurture and we lean on. But then we kind of get this, well, I wonder if he's okay if I do this. Kind of the things that kids begin to do. And then we get some knowledge to us, and we just want to show up to the grown-up conversation and act like we know everything. Then we hit the teenage years, and we want to see what we can sneak around and get away with. Only to come back and go, God, you've been faithful, and it's only your grace. It's only your grace through every season of our life. No matter how great of a tragedy you've walked through, no matter how, how, how great the triumphs you've had, it's God's grace that brought you through, and it's God's grace that keeps you going. See, it's not that, that I'm trying to say, well, I just needed a little bit of grace. And other people trying to say, well, I needed a whole lot of grace. Can I tell you, we all needed the same amount of grace because we all come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ spiritually dead as broken people and in desperate need of grace because apart from God, we could not make it. 
But then there are these but God moments. But God, right? It is a understanding of those but God moments that when we're searching and we're confused, the grace of God says, but God will show us a way. When we're hurting or empty, it's the grace of God that fills that void. When we're addicted or in bondage, it's the grace of God that will set us free. See, we were despicable, but God, by his grace. You got to remember the person who's writing this. He used to kill Christians. He was a modern day, what you would consider, most of us consider a terrorist. Imagine his story. He's breathing murderous threats to the church of Jesus Christ in his infant stage. He's determined to rid the world of the followers of Jesus, hating everyone who loved Jesus. He's got a commitment to kill them. He was kidding, but verse four says, but God. Here's what it says, read with me. It says, but God, who is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. The Lamb of God paid the price which gave us the foreshadowing of a grace that would redeem us. But God, who is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. He's saying, you were, you were despicable. You were wicked. You were vile. But God made a way, and now by his grace, you are saved. That's what the woman called an adultery that we talked about several weeks ago. She deserved to be stoned, but God's mercy did not stone her to death. But grace said, go your way and sin no more. When the father in the gospel of Luke had the two sons and the one wanted his inheritance and he went away and he told this parable. When Jesus tells this parable, do you see what happens, right? One son went and lived this, this crazy, wicked lifestyle with the inheritance that he asked for too early and the other son stayed, but the other one came back and mercy and grace was bestowed upon him, but the other one got angry. Can I tell you that if you've been in church for a long time, you're by the grace of God, you're saved. So the grace of God that brings someone else home, we celebrate with, we're not jealous. We want people to experience the grace of God. And because we've been faithful to Jesus for seasons and seasons, faithful to the Father's house, we shouldn't be mad when someone who hasn't comes home. We should be, we should be thankful. It's the grace that throws the party for them. It's the grace that says, let's put the best ring. Let's, let's, let's have the best because it's, we understand that all of heaven rejoices when that which was lost has been found. When the sinner on the cross saw this man who had done nothing wrong in Jesus, said, remember me. And he said, what? You will be with me. It is God's grace, God's grace to us. Every single one of us, every, we were, but God, by his grace, changed us. If you've ever betrayed someone you loved, or you haven't been the parent you should have been, or the spouse you should have been, and you're ashamed of your past, or you don't even like possibly who you've become, Remember this, it's not because of your goodness, it's because of Christ's goodness. This is the part where so many times in the church, people begin to zone out and go, oh, he's about to close, he's going to pray, he's going to ask us to bow our heads, and we're going to have a chance to get saved or have God show up and blah, 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 lunchtime. <laughs> Start checking out. Don't check out on me because we're just getting to the good part. Jesus did this for you. It's easy for us to think about how great God's grace is for everybody else, but if we don't realize that God's great grace is for us, as a person, as an individual, if we don't understand that this amazing grace is for each one of us, then we're going to keep living as if it's for everyone else and not us. And it's going to keep us from living the way God desires us to live. Jesus did this for you. Who did Jesus come for? 
Who did Jesus come for? Did he come for the healthy? No, he came for the sick. Not the righteous, but the unrighteous. Why? Because God saw the brokenness and his mercy made a way and the grace of Jesus Christ gave us access. We weren't semi-sinners. We was lost. And because the tomb is empty and because the Lord is risen and because his grace is extended to us, we can live free. Can I help you understand today that this book is full of God's grace? You go, oh, there's so many rules. No, no, no. There's so much grace. What tells me I can't, no, 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 is teaching you how to live in grace. What's telling me I need to live self-controlled? No, the grace of God to keep yourself. It's God's grace that gives us a standard. Can you imagine if God gave the very best and set us free, but gave us no grace to sustain us? It's like, oh, hey, this is how so many people live. Oh, I accepted Jesus. Now I'll just do whatever I want. No, no, no. Because I've received Jesus Christ, I don't want to live the way I used to because God's grace has redeemed me. God's grace has restored me. And now God's grace is going to carry me. And the grace of God will never take us where the will of God can't keep us. And we have a chance to live this gospel message, this simple gospel message that Paul says here, because God is grace, you were. Come on, some of you got to get in touch with who you used to be because understand, and you'll get off your high horse and you'll actually start loving people again. You'll get, off of, you'll get off of your self-righteous kicks and how you're so great and you're so awesome and you've been, can I tell you, you ain't all that. Jesus is all that. You want to take too much credit for everything. Why don't you reflect the credit to the one that deserves it? Well, I've been teaching for, who cares? You know how many people that talk, there are people that are going to work miracles that are going to be departed to the lake of fire. It's only God's grace. The great things you do, well, I've done this and I've done that. No, 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 no. God's grace allows you to be a part of what he's doing. Gives us a chance to get it right. Gives us a chance to live holy. It gives us a chance to be changed. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is a gift, not by works, so that no one can boast. I spent so many years worried that someone was gonna confuse the people about grace. Oh, somebody's gonna miss it, and someone's gonna, they're gonna say something about grace, and they're gonna be like, amen, that's right, I'm a struggle. That's right, I ain't perfect. And none of y'all are either. Stop judging me. I was always nervous people were gonna use that. Can I tell you, when you fully receive grace, you ain't looking for an excuse. You're looking for the Savior. You're looking for the Savior. Come on, I want you to stand with me if you're able all across this room today. just so thankful for the grace of God. Can I tell you today, you were. Some of you under the sound of my voice, you're in that moment right now where you may be in this brokenness, in this dysfunctional, in this wretched life. God wants to save you today. Then for the rest, God wants to remind you you were before me you were don't forget where God has delivered you from 
Don't forget, because if you don't forget, you'll always be grateful. And then what you'll do is you'll show grace to people so they can receive Jesus. So instead of standing, if this were the cross, see, when you receive the cross and the mercy and the grace of Jesus, you come from this side onto this side because you've received that gift. What you never want to do is step back out here and start doing this to people. Up, oh, hang on. Hang on. I don't like the way you're walking. I don't like the way you, eh, I don't like what I saw where you was hanging. Eh. No, our job is to get people to grace. We, so instead of standing like this, we stand back here and go, hey, come on. Because guess what? If God can save me, he can save anybody. He can save anybody. You were. You were as lost and broken as anybody ever has been. But because you're on this side, you get to receive. But God, who is rich in mercy, delivered us, delivers you. We gotta have those but God moments. His grace gives us those but God moments. And we receive it by grace, freely given, freely given to us. But it wasn't free for him to give it. The mercy of God and the decision that he made not to punish us but it's the grace of God, it's the decision of God to save us and to bless us. You were, but God stepped in and by his grace, we will never be the same. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Today, I want us to leave here with a healthy mindset of God's grace, his power and his glory in our life. God's beautiful, wonderful, marvelous, grace Lord today as this room becomes an altar as this room becomes an altar and for those that are watching online today may your grace show up in our lives may we receive it May we never be the same. So Lord, today, Lord, today we're asking for your grace to be poured out on us. And as it's poured out, we're asking, Lord, may we receive your grace. Come on, no one looking around today. You just in agreement with us in the house today. You say, Pastor, I just want a fresh touch of God's grace in my life. Today, some of you got to receive it for the first time. You have to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. And all you have to do is ask Jesus to forgive you. Ask him to be your savior. Believe he raised Jesus from the dead. The third day, you can be saved today. Just repent of your sin. Lord, forgive me. Cleanse me be my savior. Jesus, you pray in Jesus' name. You pray that way. You can be saved today. But maybe you're going through and you need, maybe you're going through something, experiencing something and you need God's grace. It's unmerited favor. You need to receive that today. You need a fresh touch of that. I just want you to lift your hands and receive today. Lord, today you see every need, you see every moment. Lord, grace that delivers, grace that sustains, grace that empowers, and grace that gives us the ability to live a life that honors you. So today, may grace be pulled out, poured out in this place in its proper biblical form. That we're not looking for an excuse to live sloppy. We're looking for a solution so we don't have to live that way anymore. And Jesus, you made it possible by your grace and your mercy. So Lord, today, have your way. Have your way in our lives. Have your way in our lives that we would never be the same because we understand a glimpse of your grace. Because we understand your grace, Jesus, may you have your way. 
the grace that's going to deliver someone from a stronghold that no one else knows about in this room. You're going to deliver them by your grace. Lord, someone tomorrow is going to tell, or today possibly going to tell someone about Jesus, and they're going to find their way to God because they had some boldness, and that boldness is only going to come by grace. Someone today is going to stop being a mean, hateful, what they would dare say Christian. But Lord, it's not possible to be mean and hateful and a believer. So Lord, today your grace poured out. They're going to show what the love and the mercy of God looks like. You're going to do new things because of your grace. Because of your grace. Because of your rich love. Because of your rich mercy. May you have your way. In Jesus' matchless name. Lord, make your face to shine upon us. Will you carry us in wisdom? And may you give us the ability through your grace to live a life that counts for your glory and your honor. Jesus, be honored in every shape and facet of our life. God, may you empower us in ways we never dreamed or imagined because of your grace that has made it possible. Lord, carry us from this house. In Jesus' matchless name, amen and amen. May the Lord bless you today. If you want to stay in worship, please stay. If you're done, may the Lord bless you.